are really looking good today. You're amazing. It is good to see you. Uh, it's especially good today to see Claudia and Jamie having survived a direct hit from the tornadoes a couple weeks ago. Um, God bless you, and we're glad you're with us here today. Thank you to everyone who um, has contributed so much to this day for the flowers that you have dedicated to those that you love, to the music that you've dedicated as well. Thank you, and then for the musicians. Uh, I don't even know how you write hymns for two organs, <laughs> but you guys bring the organs alive. Jamie and Josh, thank you, and timpani and brass and the choir, magnificence. Thank you, thank you all. Today is the final sermon series in the series on Jesus. We've been focusing on medallions in the Jeffrey window, and today we finish with the beautiful Ascension window. And I like to share the story that if you look closely on your bulletin cover, you can see it so well, but if you look closely, you'll see Jesus on a rainbow. Well, for the longest time, we didn't know Jesus was on a rainbow because all the coal dust had covered the window, and when it was cleaned and restored a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, he's on a rainbow. Like, we didn't know that. So soak it in and love it up. It's Jesus on a rainbow. I love it. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Dr. Albert Schweitzer penned these words about Jesus long ago in perhaps the most significant book of its time, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. He wrote, He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old. By the lakeside he came to those folks who knew him not. He speaks to us the same words, Follow thou me and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as in ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience, in their own time, who he is. Who he is? Who is he? Who is Jesus? How has he revealed himself to you in your toils and conflicts, in your suffering that you pass through? On Good Friday, I received a text from a dear friend, Sister Barbara, Dominican Sister of Peace. She wrote to me, Tim, I met Jesus yesterday when I washed the feet of our infirmary sisters and saw their eyes light up. His light was shining through them. She met Jesus washing the feet of the sisters. I've met him too. I've met him in the eyes of newborns, some of who came through the door this morning, <laughs> that I saw you on your first day of life, who were delivering to each one of us heaven to earth, I've seen it, I've seen him in the eyes of those on their final ascent from earth to heaven. I have met him sitting with the children at 9 or 11 on the steps of the church as I listened to them and learned from them. It happened again this morning with Ezekiel. He was teaching me there. I meet him in the peeking through eyes of compromands who have stories to tell but often struggle to give voice as their lives are turning from childhood to young adulthood. I have met him in the deacons who show up every single Sunday and have forever, it seems, to serve us with love. I have met him in your homes. I've met him at hospital bedsides in those moments when you have faced the agony of the soul and you become vulnerable beyond belief as you open yourself in your pain. I see him in your eyes today. I see him in this room today. I see that we're carried away with the bliss we feel in his presence. I believe you've met him too in the toils, the conflicts, and the suffering that you have passed through in this experience we call life. But only you can say for yourself, if you have, 
On the first Easter, the three women who knew Jesus best rose before sunrise in the midst of their deep pain, and they went to his tomb. These three women came in their grief and in their deep need to reconnect with Jesus one last time. They came to wash and anoint his dead body. Consider very carefully who these three women were. Mary, the mother of James, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know her. You were singing about her just a few months ago at Christmas. She gave birth to Jesus in Bethlehem. She was the teenage mom, the woman who gave us the Magnificat, glorifying God and praising God's justice and presence among the poor. Now, at 47 years old, her 33-year-old son has just been crucified, and she has come to wash his body one last time. You know who Mary is. Salome was, was Mary's sister, Jesus' aunt. You know, Auntie Salome. Many believe she was present at Jesus' birth and assisted the midwife. Now, you know some sisters are like this, right? You just can't separate them. <laughs> and that's what the, how these two were. The two sisters could not be separated. They were together all the time. So you know she never abandoned her sister. And if she never abandoned her sister, she never abandoned her nephew. She watched him grow into the greatest rabbi, the greatest teacher and healer of all time. Auntie Salome was there. And Mary Magdalene. The question I often have about Mary is, who saved who? Did she save him or did he save her? They somehow found each other and Jesus loved her back to life. And when she was back alive again, she followed him like no one else. She was by his side all the time. She was the most faithful disciple. They don't count her among the 12. Maybe it's because she doesn't deserve to be among the 12 because she is number one. She is the first true apostle. Mary Magdalene was there. These three women were unmovable. They were incorruptible. They were the solid bedrock forming the foundation of our faith. Nothing ever kept them from the side of Jesus. Nothing would ever separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And yet, the Gospel of Mark ends with these women leaving the empty tomb, and he says, they fled and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Afraid? Let's be honest. This ending doesn't make any sense. It's just stupid. It's a stupid ending. You know, I've been around a long time. It's about time I call it for what it really is. It's a stupid ending, okay? Several centuries later, an exegete, which is an editor who tries to change a stupid ending into a better ending, gets a hold of it and adds some more verses, thinking no one will notice that we just added 12 more verses, which is even stupider. So these guys don't seriously pay attention to people of faith. We know what they're saying. If there's anything we can say and testify to this morning, it is that Mary and Salome and Mary said something to someone because they were not afraid. That's the whole point of this story. Here's what I think. I think Mark was afraid. That's what I think. I think Mark was afraid. I also believe he was upset that women get the credit for witnessing Christ's resurrection and leading followers to Jesus Christ because he didn't want women to get the greatest moment in history. That's what I believe. Now that's not in any creed anywhere, but that's just what I believe. Mark was afraid, not the women. It was Mark's issue, not theirs. Now, Mark was not the first man nor the last man to question women who discover and witness the truth and justice and love that is in this world. Am I right? Be careful how you answer that, men. Am I right? I think I'm right. I think Mark was just slower than the women. But men are often slower than the women in picking things up. On our fourth child, my wife said to me as I changed a diaper, I think you finally got it. It only took four. <laughs> so, 
If you need evidence of how slow men can be, and this is not a put down of men, I just think we need to own this for a second. Turn to the book of Acts. We just heard it. Peter is slow. It takes Peter a long time to understand the powerful, inclusive love of God in Jesus Christ. He finally gets it when the centurion comes to him with his family to be baptized into the faith. He acts surprised and shocked, but he shouldn't be because the centurion has heard the good news of Jesus Christ and wants to be a part of this, right? But Peter's slow. So this happens after Christ has ascended, after Pentecost, and Peter says this in Eugene Peterson's interpretation, now I get it. His words, not mine. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. That's powerful stuff. He's slow, but he does get it. Whether you're a fast learner, like the three women, or perhaps a slower learner, like the leader of the church, Peter, you can come around and it's okay. Some of us are quicker. Some of us are slower. Some of us don't see the things we need to overcome in enough time to overcome them. No matter which speed we work on, we can count on God. As God has always done, God will love us back into the fullness of grace and the community of forgiveness. When Peter finally, get, Peter finally gets it right, his words are radically transformational. He writes the most powerful statement of witness to Jesus Christ that's in the Bible. God shows no partiality. God shows no favorites. God accepts everyone. And by that, Peter means, and we've meant for all time, God accepts everyone. Now, somewhere between the first century writing of this and this century, there's a lot of people who like to call themselves followers of Jesus Christ who don't believe that or practice that. They don't accept everyone, and that's not what the Bible says. So tell them they don't believe the Bible. There you go. Boom. Drop the mic on that one when you see them. Now, God accepts and loves everyone. And God wants to be in relationship with you and with me. He wants to love you. If you want God, I love this, the door is open. Now, back to the fast learning women and then I'm done. We must admit, if the women had actually said nothing to anyone out of fear, our faith would be a farce. There would be no church, there would be no Christmas, there'd be no Easter, there'd be no Pentecost, there'd be no baptism or Holy Communion, there wouldn't be an ascension window with Jesus sitting on a rainbow, there wouldn't be a cathedral of grace, there wouldn't be a community of faith that follows Jesus. Perhaps because we like spring, we would have gathered today to celebrate some beautiful pagan festival of spring replete with eggs and jelly beans and peeps and chocolate bunnies. Oh wait, we just did that. Okay. All right, anyway, but there wouldn't be a church. The reason we are here today is the powerful witness of those three women to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were as they always were, courageous, strong, forthright, and fearless. When Peter and the disciples were fleeing from Jesus and his time of need, the women stayed. While men ran away, the women moved closer. They stuck with him. We know something deep inside these three women stirred on that first Easter. Something stirred that they would go to the dead body of Jesus of Nazareth to anoint his body. They loved him. They knew he was the Son of God. They knew he was the Messiah. That's what got them up that morning. They had watched him die on the cross. Their only fear might have been that the last they'd seen him, his body was mangled and beaten and bloody, and they didn't want to see that ever again. But that didn't stop them. The young man, some say an angel, told them to tell the other disciples that Jesus was raised from the dead and would go before them to Galilee, which is their happy place. Think of the places in your life that you go for peace, a place to get away. That's where Jesus would meet them, when they were at peace again with him there at the beach. If they were silent, they were only silent for a second. God was setting the story of his son into a whole new gear. 
God unleashed the Holy Spirit, sent Jesus out into the world with the commandment that he'd given them just a little while ago to love one another, and the Spirit of God was loose in the world. We know that in our own times, there are spirits that wish to destroy the Spirit of God. The times we're living in feed off of anxiety and fear and hopelessness, like a predator looking for a weaker prey. This energy in our world today seeks to cut down and destroy what is good and resilient in this world. But guess what? Melissa was right when she said to the kids, we're Easter people. Easter people rise. We do not give in to that spirit. And the truth is, you can't stop the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, but every time I look back at that line I wrote, I think of the song from Hairspray. You can't stop the beat. You know, I mean, you cannot stop it. That spirit just takes off, right? It just goes. You can't kill the spirit. You can't stop the spirit. The spirit will continue to soar in our lives and in this world no matter what comes after it. Think of it this way. The unsettling ending of Mark's gospel is God's way of giving each of us a way to finish this story. Those three women multiplied through the centuries. In our times, I have known many women. And the funny thing is about women, they're like rock stars, seriously. You mention their first name and people's faces light up, right? I mean, just watch this. Arlene, Dorothy, Marguerite, Ruth, Lillian, Rosa, Barbara, Elizabeth, Betsy, Lola, Joan, Josephine, Ethel, Septima, Blanche, Maya, Ruby, Fannie Lou, Coretta, Ella, Odessa, Eleanor, and Esther, and the list goes on. You say one name, and everyone knows who you're talking about with women. With men, you're not as sure. <laughs> when fire meets joy, and the Holy Spirit is loose, watch out for women. There will be no stopping any of us with the Holy Spirit loose and wonder women on our shoulders our risen Savior is not done with us yet, and we are not done either. Paraphrasing Dr. Schweitzer to close, Jesus is speaking to us in the exact same ways he spoke to those so long ago, follow thou me. He will set us to the tasks which he has need to fulfill, and we shall know him and we shall learn in our own experience and from our own lives who he is. Amen.